name is Kate Thompson. I am the author of The Little Wartime Library, and I'd love to share with you today the story behind the story. June 13th, 1944, and Bethnal Green is under fire. The streets are bathed in a choking, acrid smoke as a German V1 flying bomb explodes out of the atmosphere, hitting a railway bridge and nearby houses. Bodies litter the ground, houses burn, and screams pierce the air as people are pulled dead from the scorched wreckage, including a 19-year-old mum and her eight-month-old baby boy, eviscerated by Hitler's first revenge weapon on their way to the shops. The age of missile warfare has begun. Deep below the ground and protected from the latest chapter in this unfolding horror, one 15-year-old girl is oblivious. Pat Spicer wanders up the long, gloomy tunnel with her nose in a book, scarcely noticing the ripe stench of so many unwashed bodies or the distant crump of the rocket's meteoric impact. But Millie Molly Bandy has her enthralled. Pat has just visited Britain's only underground tube shelter library, built over the boarded up tracks of the Westbound Tunnel at the Central Line at Bethnal Green in East London. Contrary to popular belief, during the Second World War, not all shelterers slept in an amorphous huddle on a dirty underground platform. The history of World War II is full of surprises, mostly tales of unspeakable deprivation, sacrifice and bloodshed, but just occasionally magic. Bethnal Green's secret underground wartime library offers up a remarkable story that reveals how, even in the darkest of times, working class EastEnders had access to books, entertainment and culture. The vibrant subterranean community which existed in, in East London has been unearthed and 80 years on I'm celebrating it in my new book, The Little Wartime Library. But how did a lending library operate where tube trains ought to run? Are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. On September the 7th, 1940, a bomb crashed through the roof of Bethel Green Central Library at 5.55pm on what would later be known as Black Saturday, the start of the Blitz. What had been an orderly and well-equipped library became in a split second a scene of destruction. And here the story takes a surprising twist. Rather than simply hurrying for the nearest shelter, the borough librarian George F. Vale and his deputy Stanley Snape calmly pulled a tarpaulin over the shattered glass dome roof and set about planning a pioneering social experiment that would transform the lives of wartime Londoners. Bethnal Green Underground was a half-completed stop on the central line when war broke out. Builders were connect working on connecting it to Liverpool Street, but from September 1939, it had been locked up and left to the rats. One week after the Blitz began, EastEnders defied Churchill's orders not to shelter in tube stations and claimed their right to safety. At 78 feet below ground, it was one of the few really safe places to shelter in Bethnal Green. Three months after the Blitz began, in December 1940, Bethnal Green Borough Council leased the station from London Passenger Transport Board for £510 per annum, and the station was transformed into a fully functioning community with an astonishingly advanced array of facilities. Metal triple bunks, less hospitable to lice, sleeping up to 5,000 stretched three quarters of a mile up the eastbound tunnel. A shelter ticket reserved you a bunk and you needed it. On one fiery blitz night, a record 7,000 people slept down there. Order was kept by a stout, no-nonsense ARP warden by the name of Mrs Chumley, who reputedly ruled with a rod of iron. Her booming voice could be heard echoing up the tunnels. Shelters weren't short of entertainment. There was a 300-seat theatre with a stage, spotlights and a grand piano, which hosted opera, ballet, wartime weddings, a cafe serving hot pies and bacon sandwiches, doctor's quarters, a WVS-staffed wartime nursery, which enabled newly enfranchised women to go out to work. But best of all, from October 1941, a little library. Libraries in converted shops, in village halls, in mobile vans are common enough, but libraries in tube shelters are something new under the sun. Librarian Stanley wrote gushing in Library Review in the spring of 1942. When Londoners undergoing the heaviest bombardment in history defied all laws and rules by taking possession of the tube, it was quickly evident that a new social situation was in being. The wheels of bureaucracy clearly moved fast in wartime and a grant of £50 was approved by the council. The borough surveyor was quickly on the job, writes Stanley. All last summer the caverns echoed to the din of hammers and saws. The result was a triumph. 
The library, which had a captive audience during a raid when the doors to the shelter was locked, were, was open from 5.30pm to 8pm every evening and loaned out 4,000 volumes of conscien conscientiously chosen stock. Romance sat alongside literary classics, children's books, poetry and plays, Treasure Island, Secret Garden and so many other classics, including Enid Blyton, nourished young minds and helped children to escape the unfolding nightmares above their heads. Can you imagine growing up on a tube station, your childhood unfolding next to the track, all your rites of passage taking place in the booking hall or along the tunnels? Patsy Crawley from Essex doesn't have to. The first six years of her life were spent mostly down Bethnal Green tube shelter. It sounds funny now, she told me, but back then it was just normal. I knew no other life. My mum, Ginny, volunteered at the tube shelter cap. She was such a lovely, smiley lady, always bustling around a million miles an hour in her apron. When she was working, I'd knock about with my six male cousins, and we had such fun running up and down the tunnels like tube rats. We used to dare each other to go into the room of horrors, as we called the ventilation chute. It was strictly forbidden, but being kids, we climbed in. All the kids used their imagination, she told me, playing hopscotch, skipping, it and kiss chase up the tunnels. During the war, the facilities were amazing down the tube, Kate, she told me, and everything you needed. There was even a mobile hairdresser who used to come down the tunnels doing people's hair out in rags before bed so they woke up with nice curly hair. When war was over, I miss life underground, and even now when I go to Bethel Green and I see the tube sign, I feel a warmth spread over my chest, she told me. To others, it's a transport network. To me, it was my home. Heartbreakingly, that home was tinged with horror one dark, wet night in March 1943, when 173 people were crushed to death on the 19 dark, uneven steps going down to the shelter, when, with the sirens wailing, a mother carrying a baby tripped. The sights that night were unimaginable. ARP wardens work, worked alongside housewives and Boy Scouts to save the injured. Bodies were piled into anything with wheels and rushed to hospital. Mrs Chumley wrenched children free from the crush with such force that their shoes were left behind. When word came back, the hospitals had no more room. Bodies were taken to the crypts of nearby churches or laid out on the pavement next to the bombed library. It took more than 60 police, rescue workers and volunteers to pull the corpses and injured people from the top of the staircase. The darkness, the pressure and the angle of the bodies made extricating people from the crush slow and difficult. Horrifyingly, dead and alive were pressed together in such a tangled mess of complexity that it was three hours before the last casualty was pulled out. Authorities moved quickly, washing down the steps and ordering those that witnessed it to say nothing. The fearful explosion people have, had heard hadn't even been enemy bombs, but the government testing new anti-aircraft missiles from a recently installed Z battery in nearby Victoria Park. One of the Second World War's biggest civilian disasters was quickly hushed up under the Official Secrets Act by a wartime government desperate to avoid news of the scandal falling into enemy hands. But of course the enforced silence just compounded the survivors' feelings of guilt. Rescuers' hair turned grey overnight, Our families were torn apart at the loss of all of those children. Patsy, who we last saw playing Kiss Chase up the tunnels, lost five members on her family on her father's side, including her aunt Mimsy, who was clutching her eight-month-old baby boy, John, when they were both caught up in the fatal crush. I can't think about it without feeling breathless. You know, with no counselling or acknowledgement of what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder, survivors and witnesses were forced to suffer in silence. Over the years, I have interviewed a great deal, many survivors, including the impressive young female doctor who was on duty that night when the trickle of corpses coming into hospital soon turned into a flood. Six months before her death, age 102, heroic Dr. Jo Martin, MBE, confided in me, it was a night of undiluted hell. We'd scarcely moved one body when another arrived. Soon the casualty ward was transformed into a morgue. Joan worked through the night, saving lives where she could, growing increasingly sick of heart, especially at the sight of a young woman's cold fingers, tightly curled as if she'd been grasping something. The woman had been desperately clutching her child's hand as they tumbled to their deaths. I was haunted by vivid nightmares of people being trampled to death every single night for 73 years, Joan confessed. The deadly pileup illustrates the spectre of death under which women and children on the home front lived. Perhaps that's why the library staff felt such a fierce loyalty towards their patrons. Stanley Snaith wrote movingly of EastEnders like Pat, Patsy and Ginny. Each dusk sees the first contingent making its way down to the bowels, to the bowels of the earth. 
the well and the ill, the old and the young. Here a choker docker, there an undersized lad with an atlas load who probably poised on his head, aiding his crippled mother. In the library, the youngsters are vocally busy with their, books, with their book selection, but why should they not chatter to their heart's content? These youngsters are now in their 90s and memories of the little library are embedded in their hearts. It was a sanctuary to me, Pat Tup, who is now 92 and living in Berkshire, told me. By 1943, I was 14 and there had just been so much horror, the blitz, the tube disaster, then the rockets. You can't imagine what that library represented to me as a place of safety. It sparked a lifelong love of reading. This October 2022, Bethnal Green Library, now firmly reinstated above ground, celebrates its centenary and its astonishing history as a symbol of resistance. Libraries are places of learning and escape, offering solace, sanctuary and trustworthy information which in a conspiracy theory age makes them more relevant than ever. In fact, a library is unique. It's the only place that you can go from cradle to grave that is free, safe and democratic. Never have we needed or valued our libraries more because as little Pat discovered, you can escape life's vicissitudes when your nose is buried in a good book. Today is the drone of central line tube trains which reverberate through the station. But 80 years ago, it was the magical sound of children's laughter and the satisfying thunk thunk of a librarian stamp which echoed up the tunnels. Thank you. I'm dyslexic. Reading as a child, there were a lot of challenges around that, but I loved the stories. I was trying to think of some of my favourites. So The Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe, The Secret Garden. It was all about escapism, these wonderful journeys. That is what libraries are for me. It's opening a door into another world of possibilities. I feel so strongly about this. How does a book help children? Well, it gives them a choice. When you read as a child, not only does your imagination get sparked, but opening that wardrobe, going into Narnia is like walking into a library. It's not about the book. People come into the library in search of something. I can tell what people need before they even speak. Knowledge, escape, safety, guidance, enrichment, magic. It's a privilege to be a part of that search. After all, are we not put on this earth to help one another? Thank you. My old manager, Pat, was an irreverent, anarchic man in a tank top. You're never alone with a good book, he used to say. I've never forgotten him. He made me into the library worker I am today. Uh, for me, libraries are truly a magical place and it's not just about uh, books for me, it's also about culture in general, so uh, I wouldn't be surprised to find uh, movies and video games and board games uh, in libraries, but also it's about community, it's one of the last places where you're not expected to spend any money there and uh, I think it's a truly precious and magical thing to have and to cherish and my cat agrees with me apparently so <laughs> that's a true sign of, uh, of uh, the truth. <laughs> Librarians are facilitators, entertainers, empathizers, listeners, educators and friends. Libraries are about much more than just buildings. There's no such thing as a child who doesn't like reading. Just a child who hasn't found the right book. A library is more than its books. It's a place where women's lives have a potential to be transformed. I'm a librarian at the National Poetry Library in London's Royal Festival Hall. And what I love about being a librarian is introducing people to new poems and beautiful books and also reuniting them with poems that have touched them in some way. And we have a lost quote service where we track down poems that people want to rediscover, where they remember fragments of poems um, and want to discover who wrote them and um, where the rest of the poem is. And we also have a free lending service um, and if you live in the UK, we can offer you ebooks. 
Um, and every day is interesting, every day is different. And I just love being able to provide this service for people for free. I always felt that librarians should try to be encouraging, not judgmental. What you want to do is give people a great reading experience. Who are you to judge what that experience is? In the UK uh, and even other other areas where libraries are cut and cut and cut. And I, I do believe the last decade has been nothing uh, but sort of firefighting for library services. And we've never really been able to do what we, we want to do and we can do. Uh, and as I said, they, they they are a human right, they're a basic human right, and everyone should have access to it. And uh, I just long for the time where we don't have to fight and we can actually concentrate on making a difference. Um, as I say, you know, libraries are part of what it is to be human. It's one of our great achievements and, and we should nurture them and support them. What makes a good librarian? Curious mind, a flexible attitude, and empathy. Libraries changed my life, and now I'm a librarian. I just want a big neon sign that says, We are here for everyone. I'm an archivist, genealogist, specialist, generalist, fantasist, childminder, social worker, photocopier, researcher, mover, fixer, surfer, walking encyclopedia, historian, honest broker, administrator, mediator, troubleshooter, crossword solver, mind reader, all round entertainer, actor, advisor, confessor. I'm a librarian. I contain multitudes.